Hey there, folks. Uh, so extremely recently, I did a video on that uh, 720 by 480 OSD kit from OC. Um, I guess their intent was that it was drop in, but they copied some of the features from newer funny playing and some of the other kits there. Um, but they have recently released a revision of this kit that adds, well, one real feature and kind of changes the form factor entirely. So we're going to go ahead and do a brand new install here. Uh, so this is how it arrived for me. Um, I appreciate the nice, tight, clean packaging. Um, but here we've got a sneak peek at the first major revision that they've made. Uh, so we'll pop this out of there. Leave that. And we can take a look at what it comes with. So same as last time, we've got the uh, two ribbon cable adapters. Uh, one of them plugs into, well, they both plug into the board one at a time. Uh, one is for connecting it up to 40 pin Game Boy Advance consoles, the other for 30 pin, 32 pin Game Boy Advance consoles. Uh, you've got your three wires for hooking up the um, the button controls for the OSD, and then you've got the panel itself. Uh, so instead of coming with the backlight kit bonded to the LCD, uh, you've got the backlight kit bonded to the LCD, bonded to the lens itself. Well, more specifically, it's bonded to a piece of glass, and then it's bonded to the lens. So there, even though it is fully laminated, there is still a little bit of a gap between the edge of the glass and the edge of the LCD itself. Uh, but otherwise, hardware-wise, this is going to be pretty much the same kit that um, I showed off in that last video. Uh, if you want, I don't recommend it, but you certainly can um, peel up the metal shielding and take a peek at the hardware inside this thing. Uh, maybe. The clips can be a little finicky. In fact those didn't even release at all so we're just gonna not risk it just in case the other ones came off pretty easily but this one's fighting me a little bit so I'd rather not destroy it before I even begin um, anyway because this is laminated it means the install is going to be quite a bit different than the previous version uh, with the previous version you just popped a lens on or even reused your original lens if you wanted uh, and then just drop this thing in from behind but now this thing, you, ha you have to cut the shell out to clear the LCD and then drop it in from the front. Um, shouldn't be too bad. I'm going to be using the uh, aftermarket cloud game store housing for this um, for two reasons. One, I really like them. I think they look really neat. <laughs> uh, but two, aside from any pre-modified shells, which if those exist, they're just taking existing shells and then cutting them on a CNC router. Um, but aside from pre-modified shells, this is going to be the closest shell that we can get um, that requires the least amount of modification to get this thing to fit. Uh, so one thing that Cloud Game Store does on their shells uh, that uh, most aftermarket OEM-like shells don't do uh, is Cloud Game Store does not include those little bumps on the inside of the screen area. Uh, so on OEM shells, there are some ridges along this side and along the bottom uh, that kind of help seat the OEM screen within the housing. Uh, Cloud Game Store, I guess they figured, well, if you're going to be using an OEM screen, you can, you can align it by hand and figure it out for yourself because most everyone's going to be using a backlight kit anyway, especially if they're using a shell like this. Um, so that is going to decrease the amount of trimming that we need to do, but we will still need to widen this gap out quite a bit so that we can get this thing to seat in there. I just want to make sure the lens actually fits in the cutout, and it does. Can't always, uh, can't always take that for granted. That's a very complicated shape. Uh, but as you can see, there is quite a bit of material that we will need to trim out of here. Uh, but I think, yeah, I don't think it's going to be too bad. 
the scariest part's going to be on the left hand side here but the right hand side I don't even know if we need to do any on the top with these shells and the bottom should be easy but anyway let's go ahead and carry on here uh, tonight's donor is going to be oh look another silver GBA um, this thing was sitting on my desk in absolutely horrible condition and I decided to take it apart and clean the power switch and what do you know suddenly it started working perfectly fine and while I had it apart I decided to clean up all the button wells and so anyway we're starting with a perfectly functional Game Boy Advance console um, perfectly stock but also fully tested zero issues that uh, I know of at the very least uh, nothing that's showing up on any tests um, this thing is kind of gross, but trust me, on the inside, it's nice and clean. I've seen this come up a few times, so I, I, I try to mention it whenever I remember. Um, but I see a lot of people getting into Game Boy modding. Um, and they, they see people like me putting out content on YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, wherever. Um, they, they see us just grabbing junk Game Boys from whatever auction site and they do the same thing, you know. They, they see what we're doing, they try and imitate, and that's fine. More often than not, that works totally fine. Uh, the problem is... Not all Game Boys from those junk auction sites work out of the box. Um, and not everyone thinks to test the console before they start pulling it apart and adding parts to it. Uh, so I'm just trying to say make sure you actually test it. That way, after the fact, once you've gotten everything installed, if there's a problem, you can kind of narrow down what the issue is. Anyway. Seven screws later, we've got the back off, shoulder buttons, and side cosmetic pieces off. Uh, see, I told you it was pretty clean on the inside there. Let us get the power supply out. I'm going to get some baseline power usage numbers so we can see what kind of power uh, this console uses. And then we'll plug in the backlight kit run the same tests again, and that way we can extrapolate about how much power this thing is going to use. And with that information, we can calculate how long your batteries should last, approximately. Plug that in. Oh, I need to find my game. Just a moment. Alright, so that's the problem with actually using a cart that I, um, also used for testing is it's probably plugged in to a Game Boy somewhere. Uh, so we'll use this copy of Pokemon Sapphire instead. Nope, oh, just kidding. There it goes. Alright, so in the overworld with not the exact same game that I always test with, but very similar one and very similar position, uh, this Game Boy at 2.4 volts is pulling 73 to 82 milliamps? Yeah, okay, that seems about right. A um, little lower than average, but certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, good numbers. Let's try the backlight kit now. So if you don't have a power supply, uh, you definitely want to test this stuff before committing to the install. Um, especially because cutting the, uh, the housing, you, you don't want to cut the housing if you don't have to, you know what I mean? Um, let's unplug this and I will show you a better way to test this if you're not using a power supply. Two 
two more screws to get the motherboard out. Uh, open the bale, and then the screen ribbon will just come right out, and we'll set this aside. Aside for that, I will need that. But I don't need any of this because I'm not going to be re reusing the buttons or the screen or the housing. Uh, but with the rear housing, you can of course go ahead and plug in, in my case, the 32 pin side. Are these reversible? Kinda, but the mod side is only 30 pins, so if it fits in there kind of loosey goosey, you're doing it wrong that in. And you can just drop that in the housing and then drop batteries in there. But I'm going to use my power supply so that I can get some numbers. And let me also get, uh, I just cleaned up my desk because of course I did. I just want to make sure this thing does not short out on the battery terminals or anything else for that matter, but especially the battery terminals. Well, the good news is it does work. Grab some membranes. I think I've got fun colors. Eh, doesn't matter. Alright, so one or both of the touch sensors is probably making contact with something it shouldn't. Of course, it's cycling this thing. Alright, so this top one looks to change the color palette. There we go. Uh, press and hold, I believe, just cycles them. Bottom one should change brightness. We've got apparently off. <laughs> uh, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten levels of brightness. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay, so fourteen levels of brightness. They'll probably call it fifteen, but. I don't think off counts as a brightness level, uh, since realistically, this is the lowest you'll ever use it at. Uh, so, at 2.4 volts on the lowest brightness setting, this thing is pulling uh, 223 milliamps to, I think I saw a 236 peak. 237 peak. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. And then at max brightness, 2.4 volts, same game, same everything else. Uh, this console is pulling 418 to 436 milliamps. Oop, 437, I saw a peak. Um, so that is not an insignificant increase. That is, that's quite a lot. Um, 
Oh, and I guess a touch and hold on this bottom touch sensor for brightness will also toggle the um, pixel grid emulation modes. Oops. Uh, so you have what looks like there's off. You have both horizontal and vertical. And I'll, I'll show more of this later when I can get a close-up. It looks like we have just vertical now. And then probably just horizontal. Yep. And then off again. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we know it works. We know it is... Uh, quite thirsty on power usage, uh, but there is also, oh, I thought that was shorting. Um, there are also a few more features that we can only access through the OSD, which means we do have to solder to get access to those. Um, as long as you don't care about those, I guess technically soldering is not a requirement for installing this thing, uh, but there are some goodies in there, trust me. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's get on with it. I'm going to unplug it from there. Set that aside. And then from here, we're actually going to set this aside because we, the first thing I want to do uh, is make sure we can get the LCD assembly into the housing itself. Um, so once we've got the LCD fitted, uh, then we can go ahead and do the wiring for the OSD and then assemble it and Bob Jaunty. Uh, so first off, let us go ahead and, oh, I shouldn't do that because that's not going to fit. Alright, that looks kind of difficult. I can't tell from the angle I'm sitting at. So what I'm doing right now is I'm taking advantage of the fact that I have a transparent housing and I'm holding the LCD assembly up to the housing itself so I can see exactly how much material I need to remove. And then from there, I'm going to take my scurple here and I'm just going to mark it out. The seller of this kit uh, does have pictures listed on the listing as far as what you need to trim, uh, but those pictures are for OEM housings, not uh, cloud game store housings. Uh, but either way, you should be able to adapt and do what you need. We'll have to be careful on this side because we don't want to cut into the area that the uh, that isn't hidden by the lens. But otherwise, it should be that simple. So, to trim this, I guess it's um, you know smoke them if you got them. If you have like a CNC router, of course, that's going to be the best option. Um, CNC mills overkill, but that'll work great too. <laughs> um, otherwise, a, um, a drill press stand and a rotary tool would be good. I am going to just go with the score and snap method. So to do that, we'll need a um, sharp tool to crease it. Um, no, I'm totally kidding. I'm not going to use this. But I will use my utility knife because that is precisely what it is for. Um, my blade is quite damaged, though. Hopefully we can get through these cuts, no problem. Um, I have spares somewhere. Uh, but the idea is... It might actually be easier to go from the front on this one. Just to lightly drag the tool on the plastic to score it. That's it, we're not cutting in, we're just 
leaving a uh, small scratch as a score mark. Then, we're going to come back and do it again, adding just a little bit of pressure. And then do it again, adding just a little bit of pressure. And do it again. And do it again. You should be able to drag the knife with almost no resistance the entire time. If there is resistance, you're probably pressing too hard. Um, and the danger with that is if the knife slips, um, A, you could cut yourself. Uh, but, you know, wounds will heal. If you slip and mark up the, the shell outside the lens area, you know, the shell's not going to heal. No, I'm kidding, but seriously, be careful not to cut yourself. Um, obviously, the shell's not going to heal, but shell's easier to replace. A fingertip is not. This one I'm going to have to be careful with because that goes right up in there. Actually I don't think we even have to cut out this much because it should slip under what with that glass plate laminated in there. I'm going to be careful how I hold this because there's really no good way to hold this and keep my thumb out of the firing area. I mean, unless I do this, I suppose. I don't feel like I have as good a grip, as good control though. I don't know. Doesn't matter. You figure it out, you be safe. You're Safety is not my responsibility. Anyway, once we've got that scored, now comes the snap part. Just take some uh, pliers, or in my case, forceps. And we just fold the plastic along the score line, and it snaps right off. Snip that though. So I can pull that off. This method is not without its uh, cleanup, but. I've always been satisfied with how it worked. Uh, I don't like how that's snapping though. I think I need to do more scoring there.
Ooh. Yeah, I don't think that's scored enough. Uh, alternatively, I can also just come in here with the knife and just cut it. Sometimes that works. Saves a little bit on cleanup too. I'm going to score this a little bit more. Right. Hopefully that's enough. Less it fights you when you have it scored enough. all went well, it'll just fit. Gotta drop the left side in. Oh, gotta drop the touch sensors in. Oh, I need to clean up that corner just a hair. And then I think we're good. I need to actually follow my cut line and not just shy of it. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Cool. All right, let me take a quick break before we continue on with the next portion of this. I want to get all this plastic and junk cleaned up. And through the power of movie magic, we're all cleaned up. All right, so now that I know that fits, don't have to do any more trimming. 
Go ahead and peel off the top hay. I should have peeled this film off, made sure there weren't any defects under the lens before sticking that on. Whoops. But there we go. Not too bad, all things considered. Uh, now we can take our touch sensors, might as well stick them down. Not like this thing's going anywhere. Though I am tempted to just cut that top one off. All it does is control the um, color palettes. I'm never going to use the color palettes. I don't want the color palettes. I don't care for color palettes. But I suppose the bottom one will be nice for quick brightness adjust, maybe, mayhaps. Yeah. Top one, if you want to install it, you can install right in this gap, right by the Nintendo logo. That is where the instructions say to drop it, but I know for a fact I'm gonna trigger that, and like I said, I don't care for the color palette, so it goes bye-bye. I'm not gonna bother desoldering it or anything, I'll just cut it out. <sighs> oh, I need to go grab some membranes. Oh, I need to wire up the buttons too, button controls. So let's do that next. So we've got two short wires and a long wire. I'm gonna guess the two short wires are for the shoulder buttons and the long wire is for the select button. Yeah, it looks about right. So we want TP2 right down here. Gives us our start button. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, wire management. I'm just going to tuck that under the legs of the CPU. And just help kind of wrestle that into place. We want TP9 over here for whatever shoulder button that is. The other one, not TP1 or TP0, but TP8. There we go.
So this is L, this is R. And I kind of hate that they put the solder pads here because soldering on top of, on the back of an LCD is a great way to ruin the LCD, but here we are. <laughs> Just like that, easy peasy. Uh, oh yeah. Do I have matching membranes? Of course I don't. Hopefully that's good enough. All right, two things to be careful of. Um, these wires are probably going to get pinched. So this shoulder button I can route in that hole in the shell when I slip it together, but this shoulder button there is no relief. Uh, I'm, oops, I'm surprised this is still an issue, but I'm going to just cut a V-notch in that wall. And then I should be able to slip that in. And look at that. Everything just slipped right into place. I'm not gonna use those. I'm not gonna use those either. It's always best to use the screws that are included with a shell, if they're included at all. Because sometimes the uh, screw posts are a little bit shorter on these aftermarket shells, and so they include shorter screws to uh, make up for that. I don't recall offhand if that's the case here, too. But finding out the hard way would kind of suck. Alright, so there are our six long ones for the housing. We've got one extra for whatever reason, and then one, two, three, one, two, three, four, excellent, okay. Those are two different screws. The short ones go into the motherboard. Because we're screwing metal screws into plastic, 
Uh, we don't need to like really crank these things down. We just snug the screw up and then back it up a quarter turn or so. Snug the screw and then back. Snug the screw and then back. over to here so I can install the shielding. to discuss this before installing it. Totally neglected that. That's my bad. It's what I get for not actually scripting these videos. Um, I know a lot of you are probably sitting here thinking, oh, well, this is laminated. Why don't we just use the uh, housing that Funny Playing already made for laminating dis laminated displays? And um, it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Uh, so this display is designed to sit on top of that shelf. We just had to make it larger so that the LCD can pass through. You can see it's adhered back here still. Funny playing displays, housings, shelves. There it is. Work a little bit differently. On funny playing displays or housings, the entire screen area is cut out. And if you look real closely at how it's cut out, you can see there is actually a wedge shape at the edge of the um, plastic here. The lens for the funny playing displays has the opposite shape cut into them. So they're also a wedge shape. So they're designed to be inserted from the rear and then there's a bracket that holds them down and then this wedge shape holds it into place, holds it within the console. That's not gonna work here, unfortunately. And I meant to do a fit test to show that, um, but here we are. Uh, there are also alternatives like the My Retro Game Case or the Retro Tetra Station uh, aluminum housings, like this build that I haven't quite finished yet. Um, I was actually waiting to take this Game Boy apart so I can snag the shielding. Um, these are designed a little bit differently too. They do work with these displays, um, but only with modified brackets. Um, and uh, if you shave out the shell a little bit. So I actually sat here with sandpaper uh, carving away at the uh, lens cutout until I could get that display to fit. But the same display we're installing. Moving on. Sorry, meant to discuss that. Totally neglected. That's my bad. Um, hopefully, hopefully, if you're watching this video to have that question answered, uh, well, hopefully you watched to this part, um, even though it's 45 minutes in. That doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel right either. Feels better though.
Same thing, plastic into metal, so just snug it and then back at a quarter turn. Snug and then back. Snug and then back. Snug and then back. And then I guess the long screw goes in here. That seems kind of silly. Well, okay. There you go. Oh, that's not installed all the way. But it also looks bottomed out, so yeah, I'm not installing that. Save one of the short screws, I guess. Use only three on the shielding. That's not bottomed out either. Okay, don't reuse the OEM one either. Definitely use one of the short ones. There we go. Now I have that screw fully installed without a lump on the front. That's tight. Well, hopefully that never has to come out. Because it lives in there now. Hey, nice. All right, I'm pretty satisfied with that. I guess I'll go ahead and install my kicker now. This is already going to be a long one. Screw it. And get this adhesive peeled back. Holy crap. All right, I think we're all set. Let's do some testing. Uh, how about a flash card?
Uh, cool. <laughs> ah, I have discovered an issue with my install. I pinched that wire. So hopefully that doesn't cause any issues. I need to take this apart and fix that. Um, now all my buttons seem to be working totally fine. Okay, so I guess that's not too big a deal. So let's do some tests real quick. Uh, you can see color bars. I know this doesn't mean too much without actually me grading my footage, but still a good guesstimate, I guess. You can see it is nicely aligned. Uh, though with the angle I'm looking at, it looks like the bottom's cut off, but when you look at it straight on, it's fine. So, that's just one unfortunate effect of the um, layer of glass in there between the lens and the LCD, is that uh, it does set the LCD back a little bit more. Uh, but, on the flip side, it did make the install quite a bit easier. Scaling is fine. Uh, let's look at that bad boy. You could see the funnel focus, maybe. There we go. You can see horizontal. Uh, this screen kit uses a 3 to 1 ratio, so 9 pixels on this LCD are being used to draw one pixel that the Game Boy Advance is outputting, so the resolution is three times the uh, original. Um, as you can see, it is a nice even integer scale, however, uh, in both the horizontal and vertical axis. You can turn on both of those. Another thing is we can use the um, touch sensor here to enable the pixel grid. You can see with both X and Y on, it does decrease the effective brightness, uh, but it does seem to work reasonably well, not totally overpowering the um, actual lines on the screen. Uh, unlike some of the other kits, uh, not, not to name names, but um, the Cloud Game Store kits, which only use a 2 to 1 ratio, uh, but also have pixel grid, it looks... It, it doesn't look too great. In fact, I've got one right here, so let's take a look for comparison purposes. I've already got the pixel grid on, uh, only the vertical lines, but that should be all we need. Oh, uh, no, we don't want So, and again, this is the Cloud Game Store kit, so a little bit different with the pixel grid on. You can see I have vertical pixel grid on, but I'm displaying horizontal lines. You can see it kind of looks like a checkerboard pattern. Um, vertical lines is fine, uh, though the lines do appear uneven. They should be even, but that's the pixel grid. Uh, and then the actual checkerboard pattern looks almost gray-ish. We can use the touch sensor to change that over. Now I have the horizontal lines on with the horizontal test pattern. Horizontal lines with vertical test pattern and then both. And then if we turn both on, yeah. So it's fine, but 
I think this is better. Granted, I'm probably not going to use either. Um, that was, oh yeah, that was both horizontal and vertical. It also supports only vertical uh, and only horizontal. Yep, there we go. And then off again. Personally, I'd use it with them off. Uh, I don't like how it affects the brightness levels. Uh, it doesn't affect power usage, uh, and it doesn't explicitly affect brightness, but because we're effectively making it so one third of the pixels are no longer passing light, as much light, um, the perceived brightness level is lower, which means you would have to increase the brightness to cancel out that change in perception, uh, which would then increase the power usage. So I don't like it. I'm perfectly happy with this look, but your mileage may vary. Next, we can actually take a look at the OSD, which is triggered by hitting uh, select L and R uh, all at the same time, just for a second or so. There we go. And you can go through the four different, five different options. We've got brightness, toggle that all the way up to 15, uh, and as low as one, but at, that's, Okay, it's not off. I thought it was off, but it's so low. Like, I don't, I don't think anyone's ever gonna use that, really. Uh, in typical one-chip fashion, we have the color filters. Um, I think just leave those off and you'll be happy. Uh, at the most, maybe the black and white filter might be useful for overriding palettes on um, Game Boy Color games, or even Game Boy Advance if you want, but I don't know. I don't really find these useful. Uh, let me actually pull up color bars and you can see what it does. Oh, look at that. You lose quite a bit of uh, bit depth, too when you go into black and white. I mean, I guess that makes sense, but still disappointing to see. Um, and then the next option is, of course, the four different pixel grid modes. You have off, vertical and horizontal, vertical only, horizontal only. But last is FRM, a feature they have appeared to have copied from Funny Playing, uh, but it should do exactly what the Funny Playing one does. So if we pull up the shadow sprite test, and you see it is nice and flickery. Um, I've been over this about 100 times at this point probably, but I'll go ahead and explain it again. Uh, the original Game Boy did not have any way of making things transparent on screen. Uh, the original Game Boy also had absolutely horrible pixel response times on their original screens. So devs got a little bit creative and turned that bug, as it were, into a feature, and to render transparent objects on the horrible original displays, they would just flicker it on and off about as quickly as they could. And with those displays, you know, it, it masked the flickering very nicely and you got a nice transparency effect. Well, newer screens, you just plain old see the flickering. Um, and that's what this test is uh, showing us. So hopefully you should be able to see the flickering on screen. I have done this test quite a few times. I've filmed it with this phone and it does seem to come out. So hopefully nothing's changed, but the preview is not very promising. Anyway, I left the, sh the flickering object in place for a little bit and then moved it over. And you can see there is actually a little bit of a flickering artifact where it was. Um, even though it's actually over here, I still see flickering right here too. I bet if I move it again, yep, I'll see the same thing right there too. However, if we go into the OSD and I flip FRM over to on, come on, close. There we go. Flip FRM over to on, you can see the actual flickering object is no longer flickering. It is nice and solid and steady. 
Uh, the flickering artifacts still remain. That is unfortunately a uh, property of the LCD itself. They will go away, but they're th gonna be here for a while. Um, as far as I can tell, there is really no reason to leave FRM off. Uh, it will probably technically increase the, the display chain lag um, because it then has to buffer the frames uh, you're going to be at least one extra frame behind with FRM on, but in my experience, it doesn't really affect much. Um, like, yeah, there's extra lag, but it's not like unplayable extra lag. Um, yeah, see, there's the flickering object still. And just as an example, let me play through a little bit of Super Mario. Oops, that's not the level I wanted. You can still see those flickering shadow spray. Oh! Yeah, I'd say it's fine. Oops. My ability to play games notwithstanding. Oops. Oh no! Oh, bye Yoshi. Yeah, seems totally fine to me. Ooh, the other good example, let's, uh, we get totally sidetracked playing games. Get the GB flash cart here and get totally sidetracked playing different games, other more different games. Let's see if the last game I played is the one I want. Yeah, it is. Yeah, boy. We got Zass. Uh, so, this is the example I like to use as the worst case scenario regarding flickering. Um, as you can hopefully see, it looks and plays totally fine, as long as I don't accidentally hit the shoulder buttons. So the reason I use this game as an example is the entire background of this stage, or I think of every stage really, is transparent. Uh, so you've got multiple overlapping sprites, uh, transparency is enabled. Um, it genuinely looks really good on the original displays. Uh, the problem is, if you, I keep hitting that button, man. Uh, the problem is, if you really like this game, and, um, I'm doing terrible. That's what I get for trying to talk and play at the same time. If you really like this game and want to play it on your IPS modded Game Boy, it's going to look terrible without the, uh, FRM feature, which, unfortunately, you do need to have it wired up to enable. But we'll flip that off, and you can see what it looks like on nearly every other backlight kit at this point. See a lot of flickering. It's not necessarily what I would call unplayable, uh, but it is extremely distracting. And that's just how this game works. That's how it was designed. It's not necessarily a bug. It's just a uh, quirk with the original hardware that the devs took advantage of and that these new replacement screens don't account for. 
Well, I guess this one does account for it because we have that FRM feature. I can just come back in here, maybe. There we go. Flip that on. Flicker be gone. Oh. oh. I didn't want to do that. <sighs> Whatever, I'll just let it time out. <laughs> it is kind of weird that that's not a uh, default setting. Like, I, I feel like FRM should be on by default. So look at that difference it makes. Oop. Anyway, I think that's about it. Let's do a couple more tests while I have the GB flashcard out. We'll go pop into Legend of Zelda. And I'll uh, do the two tests I normally do. So the first one, of course, we already know the results. The chain is not going to be flickering with FRM on, but with FRM off, we'll see plenty of flicker from the chain. The other test is I want to see if there's any weird artifacting. On uh, older kits, especially the 9380 uh, based kits in particular, this color brown and this color green, for whatever reason, uh, the LCD just cannot switch back and forth between those two colors very quickly. So when you do this in the game, you see a lot of artifacting in the green grass as the LCD itself tries to switch from green to brown and vice versa. This LCD seems a little bit better than the 9380 in that regard. So I don't see any issues whatsoever. Yeah, there you go. I'm sure there are some um, more edge case quirks we might be able to find. Um, regarding transparency, Zass is the big one. That one's like the worst case scenario I think of. Uh, F0 is another one though. Uh, the mini map overlay in the bottom left corner is supposed to be transparent. Mm. I'm sure there are others, but nothing that's coming to me off the top of my mind. Oh, let's try Mario Kart Super Circuit. Is that in my history? No, it's not. That's unfortunate. Uh, do I have it dumped? Probably not. Oh, yes I do. That's even easier. So one of the things that is often pointed out is the shadow. Uh, though I suppose that was more with the ITA kits. The shadow, when you jump up in the air like this, is also transparent. But I'm, I'm not seeing any issues, I don't see any flickering. Looks fine with um, FRM on. Uh, with it off, you could see the flickering, but I don't know. I think it's fine, either way, at least in this game. Uh, that being said though, uh, I do genuinely see no reason to leave it off. Uh, switch it on, set it, forget it, and I think you'll be good. Um, otherwise, I think that's about all I have to discuss for this thing. Uh, I will go ahead and shoot some links in the description to where you can get this stuff if you want to check it out. Uh, shout out to Retro Game Repair Shop for providing me this kit to check out. Um, like I said, it is extremely similar to the one that I already showed off, uh, except that it is laminated. Of course, that means the install is a little bit more difficult, uh, but the end result is quite a bit cleaner. 
Uh, if nothing else, there should never be, never be any dust between the lens and the screen because it is fully bonded. Um, you can tell a little bit that the screen isn't right up against the glass, uh, but because there's no air gap, it does still look real clean, I think. I'm, I'm really happy with it. Um, I think it's, I think it's going to be really hard to beat this kit. Um, there's only like a couple more features I can think of that might make uh, something like this worthwhile. And then, you know, once we start getting those features and kits, I, I have a hard time seeing any upgrade path after that, aside from maybe like OLED or something. But even then, OLED on a Game Boy Advance seems a little silly, uh, given the screen limitations that we've I've, I've discussed at the very least. Um, it's probably fine, but until we get those other features, I see zero purpose in zero point in having something like OLED. Uh, but the next big thing I can see on the horizon will be uh, lookup tables for actually desaturating the colors instead of increasing the saturation. I don't know why they keep getting that wrong. Um, now that it, this is gonna kind, of, this is gonna sound a little silly. Uh, but I, I've showed them the analog pocket. I said, do that. I've showed them RetroArch. I've showed them the um, the desaturation filters within RetroArch. I said, this this is what we want. They don't seem to get it. So until Funny Playing does it, they're not going to do it. I've showed Funny Playing the same thing, uh, both the analog pocket and RetroArch, and they're like, all right, yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, I, I, I don't know if that's something they're actually working on, I don't know if it's going to be coming to new kits, if they're going to port it to their existing kits. I don't know. I don't know if there's a time frame on that or anything. I just know they seem interested and we're probably not going to see it in these kits until Funny Playing does it. Um, so we're at Funny Playing's mercy for that at the very least. Uh, but until then, I think this is probably about as good as it gets. Um, I don't really have any complaints with this. I like the 9380 screens because I like that they're just a little bit bigger, you know, they take up a little bit more area on the screen lens. I think it looks better. With the exact same size body, a bigger LCD almost always looks better. Um, bezels are evil and they shouldn't exist, uh, at least on things that don't have a touch screen. Um, but I mean, other than that, the, the three to one ratio does look better than the two to one ratio. It's nice and sharp and it does give us a little bit of extra wiggle room for the features like the um, pixel grid array. Uh, unfortunately, the power usage on this thing is a little bit high, uh, but in my personal opinion, and you know, feel free to um, interpret this how you like, you know, it, my use case isn't gonna line up with your use case. So if you disagree, then sure, that's fine. That, that's a thing. Um, the higher power usage isn't really going to affect me because I don't play my consoles that long. Um, I mean, you've seen my channel. You know I have probably hundreds of Game Boys. So if the power usage was like a consideration for something, like if I was going on a trip and I needed the best, most power efficient Game Boy, I could just grab another Game Boy. I have that luxury. It's not a problem. Um, but if you only have the one Game Boy and you're concerned about the power usage, well, just get some rechargeable batteries. These nickel metal hydride batteries are extremely hard to beat in terms of, uh, uh, price for the runtime that you get. Uh, they do actually outlast most of the internal lithium ion battery mods that, um, other people are selling. Uh, I think the retro modding one gets about the same runtime, whereas the rest of them get a little bit less runtime. Uh, but the retro modding battery mod is like $40, whereas a pack of four, uh, I key a lot of batteries. So two sets of batteries is under $10. So you could get, what, eight sets of batteries for the same price as one of these things? Yeah, the runtime is, is really hard to beat, I think. Um, point is, just charge your batteries when you're when you're done using it. With nickel metal hydride in specific, you know, you get, like I said, it's a four pack, you get two pairs. So keep one pair on the charger and then when you're done playing, 
swap them out, put the other pair on the charger, let it top up. You can do that with nickel metal hydride batteries. Um, nickel cadmium, on the other hand, which thankfully isn't around anymore, that was a horrible technology, but it was what we had until we had nickel metal hydride. Uh, nickel cadmium, those ones don't respond as well to trickle charging and just keeping them topped up. But nickel metal hydride, totally fine with that, so yeah, knock yourself out. Um, it's the same thing, like, yes, being able to play the Game Boy for more than six hours in a single sitting, I can see the appeal of that if you're, you know, on a long plane flight. But realistically, I personally am never going to do that. Um, I don't, I, I don't have that kind of attention span anymore. I can't sit and play the console for that long. So I play it for however long I want to play it, and then I put it on the charge. And also, on the same point, if you are taking a uh, trip on a plane, chances are pretty good you'll have access to external power anyway. Um, I know, at least in the U.S., not all flight uh, carriers, what, what are they called? Airlines. Not all airlines have like USB ports in the back of the seats or anything like that, but a lot do. So, I don't know. Worth a consideration. But anyway, that's enough rambling. Um, I think I already said this, but I'll say it again. Thanks again to Retro Game Repair Shop for providing this kit for me to check out. I will go ahead and link to them down in the description if you want to check this thing out for yourself. Uh, I will also link to some other videos I have, um, like this thing, uh, the Cloud Game Store build that I just very, very recently did, uh, though maybe not as soon as this video goes up. I don't, I don't know which order I'm publishing these in. Um, but I will also link to the video I did on the uh, original version of this kit, which is the exact same kit, just without the FRM feature. You've got the same four options, uh, well, just the four options, whereas this new version has FRM instead of factory reset, and then factory resets on its own page. Um, otherwise, feature set and performance is pretty much identical aside from the fact that this one's laminated and has FRM. Um, otherwise, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. Keep on keeping on.